Ukrainian journalists already are now in dire need of a lot of stuff uh, to make their work safe. Media Lifeline Ukraine. With us today, we have two guests. Um, here's my colleague, Jantine van Herwijne. She's our safety uh, coordinator at Free Press Unlimited. And with us via, via Zoom is uh, our colleague from Prague, Maxim Aristavi, who um, is also a Ukrainian journalist. Um, let me start with you, Maxim. Um, you are from Ukraine. Uh, the war has started. Uh, you work with journalists on a daily basis. Um, how are you to start off with? I think like any other Ukrainian, um, it's been already a marathon. So the initial shock and uh, disbelief of what was happening to the country is kind of wears off. Although every day you see the the pictures and the videos and you call to your loved ones and you, you know, keep hearing um, horror stories that you would never imagine that will happen to your own city and your own country. Um, but yeah, I think at this point, a lot of people focused on what they can do. And um, every Ukrainian has a task and every Ukrainian feels obligated uh, to do uh, whatever it takes to end this occupation and this invasion. What is still possible for journalists at this moment? I think that the resilience is uh, is key word here because um, unfortunately for Ukraine, I mean, this is the first, uh, that kind of a catastrophe since the World War II. But in terms of covering violence and covering Russian invasion, uh, um, this is something that on much larger scale that we already faced in uh, since 2014. So luckily, uh, some journalists were more or less familiar with uh, what it's like to work in, um, in a situation of urban warfare. We also had a much smaller uh, scale, the same situation during the Maidan revolution in Kiev. However, as you can imagine, for the majority of journalists, this is not something they were ever prepared to. And they were uh, never tasked or never wanted or never thought that they're going to be a war journalist and the war will come to their homes and their cities and their uh, villages. I want to emphasize that Ukraine is an exceptionally large country and we're talking about tens of thousands, uh, uh, you know, thousands of journalists who work there on an everyday basis. And um, I think, uh, you know, uh, even supplying them with basic safety necessities such as vests, uh, protective gear, you know, helmets, we're already talking about uh, supplies in thousands that are needed already now. Um, uh, the same goes in uh, just uh, understanding that for many journalists, even those who are stayed, uh, even in the cities that are under constant bombardments, um, they cannot work 100% and do their job 100% because there are so many life and death choices they have to make every day for their families, who stays, who goes, whether they decide to relocate. So of course, it uh, impacts the way, the ability to cover events around you. Uh, on top of the trauma and PTSD and horror that you kind of see what is happening around. Nevertheless, I'm in awe of Ukrainian journalists who are now working 24-7 for almost two weeks. There is one large newsroom. There are no individual TV channels or news uh, agencies anymore. Everybody works uh, in one effort to cover as much as possible. And uh, um, this is also remarkable because, again, Ukraine is such a large country, so you have so many regions. And still, even from the Russian-occupied territories in the south, we keep receiving a lot of reporting on an everyday basis. Now, of course, these are two weeks. We cannot go on forever like that. Uh, Ukrainian journalists already are now in dire need of a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, to make their work safe. Uh, but uh, this is something that we must already act now to, uh, to fix because of broken supply chains, because of difficulties of sending anything uh, to war-affected uh, areas. Mm -hmm. 
I think the the solidarity, as you mentioned, is really, really, uh, um, yeah, I think it's really helpful and hopeful in a way in this, this really dire situation, of course, to see. And uh, I think it's really promising that we see so many news still coming from many areas in Ukraine. And I, uh, I really hope we can maintain that uh, free flow of information uh, going mm -hmm. in the coming uh, period. Um, that's actually why we're here today. We launched very recently the, the uh, lifeline for media lifeline for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I still need to get used to the term, but yeah. <laughs> uh, Jantin, you're here with me. Um, uh, let's talk about uh, what journalists need and what we're already doing at the moment. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about that? So I think um, journalists need safety, they need protection. So what we did before the conflict started, we already prepared for safe shelters for our partner organizations. So we have quite some partner organizations. Uh, we provided those journalists with safety kits, including medicines, bandages, uh, a flashlight, so that they you know, could keep themselves safe. Yeah. But then when the conflict started, you know, we realized that people really had to go to safe spaces. So we relocated, uh, I think, about 50 journalists up to now. We provided them with a hundred VPN subscriptions so that they can be safe online. Yeah. Um, and so now it's about all, all kind of forms of safety and exactly for them to be able to still report. Yeah. yeah. So it's a digital safety, but also the physical safety. So at the moment we uh, are sending the the protective equipment as vests and helmets. They are on the way to Poland, and then you know with other partners we will get them to Ukraine, especially to our partner organizations for them to be safe. Um, and we see a lot more is needed for journalists to continue their work. So yeah. we're working on uh, safe spaces called hubs inside the country and in Poland. So it creates co-working spaces for journalists. They can uh, just borrow the equipment they need. We will have cameras for them to use, laptops to use. We will also provide psychological support for the journalists that are in need of that after all they, they've been through it till now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that sounds amazing. Well, actually, you, you already covered my next, <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> my next question because it's about, you know, what do we actually need to start doing? But I think, is this all already on the way or should we, yeah. are there some things that we, we still need to pick up uh, at a later stage? Well, I think we need uh, more safe spaces for journalists. So at the moment we have two in Poland and they have been set up uh, for uh, journalists in Belarus. So we can yeah. just, you know, use them now as well for the journalists that are coming from Ukraine. But inside the country, it's really difficult at the moment to decide where we can have the hubs. Yeah. But we are working on it. And, you know, we have a lot of uh, contact with the journalists inside, so they can also advise us on that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Great. Well, that sounds amazing. Keep up the good work. And I think Sorry. one of the things that is also really important and mentioned by our partner organizations and other news organizations is that there's no income anymore. So they, there's no advertisement anymore, which is the main income. Uh, or members, you know, people just, it's difficult for them to get the income. So we also need to pay for the salaries for journalists that they can just survive. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's very important. Yeah, exactly, yeah. We want them to continue this. Um, Maxim, do you have anything to add to that? We, the, the Media Lifeline Ukraine, you were part of the, the launch, of course, on Friday. Um, do you yeah. see any other challenges or needs that are coming up that are not mentioned uh, already? I think that the, uh, the most important thing to add, and again, I'm not here, you know, as a talking Ukrainian journalist, I'm actually part of the same effort. And I think I, it's important to emphasize that this effort is led by the journalists, Ukrainian journalists and journalists from the region. Um, which kind of uh, important thing at the moment to to do because uh, when the country at war, you got to know um, right the situation at the time, right people, how to bring all the necessities and all the uh, stuff that is being donated across the border. Um, and luckily for us, uh, we've been working in the region for many years, including you know, Free Press uh, Unlimited as well. Um, helping journalists, not on such scale, but helping journalists every day uh, in similar situations. We've just had a, a massive crisis in Belarus when we had to help journalists to rele relocate and start their lives anew um, after the, uh, uh, the pro-democratic revolution. The same with Russian journalists and from other countries. So I think at this point, of course, the biggest challenge is 
time. Time is running against us. You know, there's, uh, there's going to be no um, uh, sense to send anything when uh, journalists will start dying. And we already have three uh, journalists killed in the, in the last two weeks in Ukraine. So I think at the moment, the biggest challenge is not so much uh, um, to figure out what we need, but figure out how fast we can gather those resources and send them across the border because the list is very simple. This is all that will protect their lives. Everything that will you know, help to protect uh, and secure them uh, as they report. And uh, also anything that will help them to have those uh, at least temporary breaks, whether temporary relocation or temporary safety houses uh, in Ukraine and outside Ukraine. This is already a dire need um, as a journalist, you know, uh, ending the second week of covering this nonstop. Um, so yeah, everything guys that you mentioned is critically important, but then again, time is running against us. We got to act very fast and anyone who wants to uh, join and chip in and be solid, uh, show their solidarity with Ukrainian journalists, they already have to uh, do it yesterday. Yeah, completely agree. Thank you for that. And uh, it's really good you emphasize how this is locally led, of course, and definitely, I mean, the, the whole idea behind the lifeline is, of course, that we're flexible and that we look at the needs that are actually relevant on a day to day basis. They can be different tomorrow or next week. And uh, we'll try to adjust to that as, as good as we can. Yeah. Thank you so much both for uh, being with us today. And uh, I wish you both very good luck with the rest of the work. This was Studio Free Press Matters. See you next time. Thank you for watching.